Tim Moore, president, CEO of the Mississippi Hospital Association, is our guest. So before we went to break, I asked you if you expected uh, any more to uh, tender their resignation from the association. Yeah. Um, I do not at this point in time. Okay. I, I've had no indication that anyone else is, is looking at it. Um, certainly, I could be surprised this afternoon. Sure. You know, that's uh, uh, kind of the situation I've been in the last couple of weeks. But uh, no, no one has made any indication that, uh, matter of fact, the calls uh, of support and hang in there and you're doing the right thing. I, it, I've been shocked at the phone calls I've gotten from people I didn't even know that have called and said, thank you all for standing up and, and trying to do the right thing. Hmm. So, you know, you appreciate that. Of course, I've gotten some that didn't like it, too. So, um, yeah. you know, let's, let's keep it balanced here. But, you know, you, you got to you got to appreciate folks that are seeing it. We are. It's nothing else but a policy issue. You know, we, we support Democrats and Republicans. Matter of fact, if you go back and look at our record the last cycle, about 70 percent, 70, 72 percent of the PAC contributions went to Republicans. Hmm. Okay. And that, now I do know one of the articles published that uh, we were a member of the AHA, and AHA sent 85% of their money to the Democrats. Well, that's not what we do here. Hmm. Okay. So well, that's the, not a, the AMA, a I think you could probably put in that camp as well, the, uh, and the American Mel- Medical Association. Yeah. And, heck, every the, doctor I've talked to says they're not a member. They've, yeah. they've all – Well, AHA, this is American Hospital Association. Right, I know, yeah. but I'm talking yeah. about the AMA. The yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So – And, of course, you look at look at the difference in power. I mean, you know, right, you're going right. to weigh heavily toward whoever's in power, whether right. it's Republican or Democrat. But, again, we have focused on everything we've done has been supported by support for health care policy, good health care policy. All right, so then given that is uh, kind of your mission, mm-hmm. then from a legislative and policy perspective, at the top of that list, the top priority oh, for absolutely. the Mississippi Hospital Association? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, we've, we've listened to our members constantly, and I mean all of our members, constantly on the, the one thing that we can do that will have the greatest impact is Medicaid expansion. Okay. And that's what's driven that approach all along. And, and I don't think that's changed for anybody, even the folks that have gotten out of the, so, excuse me, out of the association. Okay. Uh, because they still have the same financial struggles they had prior to that. So I've heard uh, to that end, I've, I've certainly talked to the lieutenant governor, uh, Delbert Hoseman, mm-hmm. on the program, who I think is um, kind of framed by conservatives in the state as sure. uh, someone who seems to support Medicaid expansion and therefore he's not conservative. When I've talked to him last time right here in the studio, this was maybe back right after the session, he said – he kind of offered tacit support for it, but he also did make the, the follow-up statement that I don't think this would solve the, the financial challenges that hospitals in the state of Mississippi are experiencing. Mm-hmm. Do, do you believe that as well? You know, I believe that it is a, uh, it's a huge piece of solving that problem. Okay. There has got to be reoccurring revenue for our hospitals in order to meet the expenses that they currently have. Now, will that fix all of it? No, sir. I'm not going to sit here and say that. Okay. But if it does not happen, it's going to continue to get worse and worse. We have a huge, and I think you and I have talked about this some, but um, we've got a huge revenue deficit in our state for health care. Right. Our expenses have gone up 19 20% since COVID. The inflationary index... Hospitals across the country had a historically bad financial year in 2022, mm-hmm. worst in history. Mississippi is no exception to that. It, it, it's actually worse than most of the country. And it goes back to our sick patients and, and the poverty level that we have in the state. So it's not only Medicaid or, or Medicare rates that have to be addressed. We have got to address the commercial payers in the state of Mississippi. When you compare those to I have looked at that, and you're absolutely right about that. And that is the truth. Hospitals and providers, and this is not just hospitals, it's doctors, it's nurse practitioners, it's it's the other people providing, providing care for patients that have got to be reimbursed to a point that they at least cover their expenses. No business model works right. unless you can recoup your expenses. So, Tim, to those who say, well, the problem with uh, generating a positive cash flow for hospitals is that their admin expenses are outsized or too high, that they need to trim those admin. I hear that a lot, just sure. to let you know on the streets. What, sure. what would you say to that? You know, I would say that um, uh, there, is, there is probably some truth to that Okay, in the standpoint that due to federal regulations, that things have had to be put in place that have now created, from a employment standpoint, 
more than 50% of your staff are non-patient care staff. Wow. That's a problem. And it's because of the regulatory Absolutely. environment? It's because of regulations. It's because of the difficulty getting payments. Uh, it's difficulty in, in systems used by payers. And I don't mean just commercial payers. Sure. It's the same thing with Medicaid or Medicare. Uh, Medicare. Yeah. And then we've got some payers that, that do a really good job processing the claims. But they may not be paying you enough to cover the cost that it costs to generate it. They may be denying the claim and deny it two or three times. Well, it costs you every time you have to refile that claim. And that's not providing patient care. Yeah, and you've also got the issue. I've personally experienced this to get uh, prior approval. For certain, for, for certain, that takes a lot of time because you get rejected a couple of times. And then you got to get the doctor involved in that. Absolutely, right. Well, you know, we had a couple of bills uh, that were actually vetoed by the governor that actually took care of some of that. The gold card for the for yeah. the providers, yeah. uh, and then also uh, any willing provider bill yeah. was in there. So, yep. and I just I, I don't know understand that. I mean, it overwhelmingly passed both the Senate and the House, and it would have been a really great bill for our hospitals and our our docs. It would have been great. Well, well, we got one carrier, Blue Cross, that covers what eighty, eighty-five percent strong uh, of the private market, more, yeah, of the commercial payers. Yeah, but Tim, that exists in our neighboring states of Louisiana and Alabama. Right. I think it's even higher. The Blue Cross is in those it states. It is in Alabama. It is in Alabama. It's yeah. like ninety-five percent in oh, Alabama, and like well, you know, that's actually who would be running the Medicaid program uh, in Alabama. That's I didn't the, know that's that. the model that they're oh, looking at. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's eighty to ninety percent in Louisiana as well. As I recall, it's a it's a pretty strong yeah, it's, number. Yeah, it's it's a high number. They, they, look, they have a strong. Uh, but why do they reimburse more? Anywhere. Why why did the, why did they seem? I've why did the with hospitals that. and providers seem to have more leverage with those Blue Cross organizations in those respective states than we do here? Well, you've got some of it is is uh, from the support of the state. If the if the state supports paying appropriately, then okay. they, they get pushed into that point. Okay. Uh, and certainly we've seen that. If you go back and you look, um, you know, we uh, we were looking to try to generate, um, and it, boy, we really get complicated if we get into this, but it's the MHAP payment, yeah. which actually covers the gap between what Medicaid pays and what Medicare would pay. Right. Well, that, that changed a little bit in the past when we brought MCOs on, uh, but... Uh, Louisiana was successful in changing the gap from Medicaid to average commercial rate. Okay? Right, it went right. From Medicaid. So that brought in $900 million hmm. to Louisiana. Okay. Okay, so that that's a key right there. That's one. We tried to do it in Mississippi. Medicaid went to work on it. They worked hard with Milliman. They come back uh, with one number, which really didn't turn out to be the right number, but they kept working on it and found out there is no gap between what Medicaid pays and our average commercial rate across our hospitals. So you couldn't do uh, a big increase on inpatient. Yeah. So that that I mean that's evidence right there. Our commercial rates are a problem. It's not Medicaid is overpaying I, I our totally providers. Agree. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I get, and I I got to tell you, I I've got uh, contacts that are high levels in yeah, these hospitals. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they said they yep. and and they point to our neighboring states as hey if we were at that level our problems go away. That's exactly right. If we were at exactly Louisiana right. or Alabama level, our hospitals would be underwater oh, financially. I think that's exactly right. We definitely would not be in the shape we're in. Yeah. Because we're the wrong. lowest cost. We're the lowest cost in the country. Right. Right. Lowest. Well, right. Exactly. I know that scares people. You've got people that's going to laugh about I know. that. I just got my it's, bill. That but it's it lowest cheap. cost and lowest revenue reimbursement. That's right. And I'm hearing more providers, Tim, say that, that uh, Medicare is getting b- b- be more difficult to deal with. Oh, that you're having to chase Medicare That's more, exactly right. almost to the point you're to deal with it, depending on the provider That's, and you know right. the services, a, that the practitioner. Accurate. Yeah, be very accurate. Because there was a time four or five years ago they'd say I'd rather deal with Medicare all day, right? We process the claims, right? Now, the, now that you've gone to the. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans. Yeah, that's a completely that's, different. That's market. exactly right. Because you've and inserted private drop. insurance in it. That's is right. what you've done. At so they're just applying a low rate of reimbursement. Right. <laughs> and so explain to our audience that the, the reimbursement. So healthcare is unique in that there are multiple prices for everything. It's not like I've explained going that's to right. the McDonald's. There's one price for a Big Mac, but when you're that's getting right. medical services. The frustrating thing to most patients is, I can't tell you how much it's going to cost. we got to wait till it's done. That's a problem. And then when you get it, there could be four different um, prices depending on who's paying for it. That's exactly right. 
and, and how much business they do with a particular provider. And, of course, you know, the mm. difference in that hamburger and, and taking care of a patient is we're all different. Oh, completely agree. So there is some, completely agree. some margin in that. If you can but, hang around, we'll talk some more. Okay. We got 10 more. In the Element Well Studio. We're back with you in the Element Well Studios. Tim Moore is our guest, the president CEO of the Mississippi Hospital Association. So the Medicaid expansion issue, why do you think most people uh, object to that? Because it's it's still pretty strongly opposed, although before I, I let you answer that question, Tim, I said yesterday on the program that I believe if we get the ballot initiative the citizen-initiated ballot measure process back into law, that there would probably be an organized effort. I know your organization strongly considered it to get a measure on the ballot to expand Medicaid, which simply means that Medicaid coverage is offered to able-bodied adults whose income is below 138% of the federal poverty level and above 100%. That's correct. That's all it does. It's estimated that there are 150,000 maybe to 200,000 that would uh, we've used 200,000 okay. just in a, as a as a number to look at but it's actually probably a little less than that. Yeah. Okay. So I believe that it would pass at the yes. ballot box and the reason I say that is because if you kind of boil it down to to political terms for the most part it's a democrat it's a Democrat program. It's passed under uh, Barack Obama because prior to that, prior to the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid was not available That's in right. general to able-bodied That's adults. Right. Less than 20 percent of the federal poverty level or something like that, which would be like $3,000 a year. That's correct. So um, before that, so it's, it's safe to say, I think, that the 40 percent of our, our voters who are Democrats would likely vote almost in unison, 100 percent, to support it. Mm-hmm. You don't need but 10 percent more of the voters, That's right. which which represents, what, 18, 20 percent of the Republicans, to support this, to, do it. to get it passed. And you... Oh, oh listen, I, I, we have had, uh, we've done polls, we've done internal polls, sure. and, and looked at nothing but GOP voters. And, uh, you know, it's 54 to 60, 54 to 56 percent of those GOP voters supported Medicaid expansion. Okay. And that's without education. That, that's just asking the call. Asking Understanding the it, yeah. So yeah. I, can, I'm, and, can I make a suggestion here? I'm please. sorry, please. Can, no, no, can, all, can, all I was going to say I is. I was going to make a suggestion. I've said you, this on the air before. The, let's take Greenwood LaFleur, who's been, I, I'm not picking on them. They've just been a focal point Pick because on. they might be in the most dire sure. situation financially of any of the hospitals in your group. And there's no doubt that they're in an area where the population has declined, and it's it's hard to make ends meet when you got a declining population. You need people, and right. you need people that need your services to generate revenue. No doubt about that. And there's no doubt that they're in a physical facility that's not optimum for today's healthcare environment. No doubt about that. But the failure. Why don't we take their financial statement? I've I've looked them up, and I've shared it on the air. I've looked at the last five years of their published reports. Why don't we take their financial statements? Let's take last year, Tim, and let's plug in, overlay Medicaid expansion Mm -hmm. using the exact same data Mm -hmm. last year, Mm -hmm. which would simply mean, okay, all these patients. I don't mean adding new patients. I mean take the same Same patients. Same store. Yeah, it's same services that they essentially absorbed because there was no reimbursement Mm -hmm. because the patient didn't have private coverage but would have been eligible for Medicaid and therefore the hospital would have been reimbursed X dollars and plug that into the model, sort of a before and after, and see what happens in their financial I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, And uh, we can make that happen. Uh, I'd be happy to share it with you. That'd be fantastic. And it's it's not that I'm, I'm doubting the suggestions about uh, how the uh, expansion would increase and improve their revenue. But let's look at that at, a, at an accurate, detailed level and, and don't f- plug in all these these uh, pro forma projections of how it right. would change the future. Right. Let's just take last year, yeah. the last three what years, two years. I, yeah, what I, I like done. that. I like it. And uh, here's a before and after. And, and I just think that would make the case a little stronger on, on behalf. And then to those... Um, and I'm trying to just moderate here between the two. And the, to those that oppose it, 
they need to come forward and say, well, these are the, the reasons we oppose it. Not say, well, here are all the problems with the health care industry. Well, I get that. We all got problems, and we those, those we are well have. taken. And certainly it, where there are efficiencies to be gained, the dang hospitals need to be working on that full time. That's I, right. I totally agree with that. Right. Support that. And so, um, and then on the other hand, though, they need to be something a little bit, I think, more substantial as to why there's opposition. And like I said before on the program, well, then uh, suggest legislation, author legislation, and put it on the floor to take Mississippi out of Medicaid altogether. We we'll just tell the federal mm-hmm. government we don't need your six billion dollars. Because that's what it is that's, now. That's what it is. Six billion. And that's our it. part's just under a billion. That's right. Just under, So we're being subsidized by the other states. I absolutely will. And somebody no just said a minute ago, well, I don't think it's right that I, as a taxpayer, Keith and Vaden, should have to pay for somebody else's health care. Keith, um, I hear you, man, and I know that's a tough one, but here's the deal. You pay for everybody's Medicare and your Medicare contributions. You're not yes, paying you for your own. That's right. You're paying for people that are getting sick that's today. Exactly right. You're paying that in your paycheck every single month. Yeah, no question. That's it. And you hope somebody's coming along behind you that'll pay for yours when you get there. Because the amount you're putting in, Tim, as you know, won't cover the amount it, it you're going not. to get, up, not even close. Mm-mm. That's why it's going broke in three years. And they're saying true. we can't pay Part A in 2028 if we don't do something. And our federal government says, we don't want to touch that. Okay, well, then it's going to fail. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't well, just walk have away to. from it. No, you can't. You can't let it. And, of course, we can't let it fail. We can't let the health care system fail. And we got we're all going to need it. And we got the same issue here in the state. And I, I guess what bothers me is there's always a lot of pointing to what won't work. But we have to acknowledge we have a problem at a minimum. That's right. What will work? I'm not in the camp that says Medicaid expansion is the silver bullet that solves this problem right. whatsoever. Right. I think there are a lot of other things that we could do, and maybe we need to seek waivers as part of that to perhaps Absolutely. incorporate um, putting people in the exchanges in lieu to of cover it. Med- Yeah, in which yeah. case there's no state cost associated and, with that. And that's a that's a good uh, a good road to kind of travel down briefly, but. Uh, you, you've got to look at the deductibles that come into the exchange products. So even if you're providing somebody coverage through an exchange and there's a $10,000 deductible that they can't afford to even pay premium, so how in the world are they going to make a $10,000 deductible cover payment? Yeah. So then you have a situation where we are subsidizing the insurance companies, but the providers are not getting anything for the services they rendered. So there, there's difficult <laughs> there, there's little traps all through this thing that we have to work through. But I'm with you. I think if we could all sit down and have a logical discussion of not necessarily trying to defeat each other, but find a solution and a compromise that works so that we can get coverage for the folks out there that are trying to work and can't afford it. it, it it's going to help all of us. When you start looking at hospitals that are having to, to stop services because of this revenue issue, that doesn't just affect the Medicaid population or the expansion population. Oh, yeah. It's it affects you and I. people, too. It, it, it's your commercial folks, too. So we all need to be mindful that it's not just a, those folks over there. When you start twisting the health care system, it affects us all. Yeah, and access will become an issue. And I, I had a friend. You know, the hospitals are still seem to be operating on a 1970s model. And in some cases, and certainly in the rural areas, they are. But how do you just forklift all that? Uh, I mean, they're, and yeah. I don't know exactly what that means. And I know there's been lots of reports and analyses written about that. I do think they're physical facilities to a great extent, because that's why so many of them, as you know, are moving to ambulatory care oh. centers, well, which are which are profitable for them. That's right. Well, and they've been pushed that way yes. by, by the payers. Yes. And I would, uh, and I don't know who that was, but I would love to sit down and talk to them and let's go visit the hospital and let's let's compare that. Now, okay, are, are there some things that are are, are tied or, or similar. But, you know, when I came into health care, yep. 75% to 80% of our patients were inpatient. Right. Okay. That's now flipped. Right. About 80% of our patients Thanks are Thanks to outpatient. technology, honestly. It's, it's technology and payers. Payers have okay. pushed us they, there. They don't want you That's, there. They, yeah. they want to go to the cheap, cheaper. Go, go cheaper home road. and take care of yourself. And, and our folks have <laughs> become innovative enough to be able to offer those services. And, you know, we've had good outcomes. And I think we'll have to continue to do that. Telehealth, hospitals at home, all the innovations and follow-up that we can do now with electronics uh, in, in most cases. But, you know, think about that. In some of our rural areas, you can't do that yeah. because we don't have the broadband to support it. But we're working on that. Yeah. We're trying to get there. Well, to get I, there. I do think that there, 
maybe some adjustments and improvements and modernization, of course, that could be made. If, in if they've facilities. got the resources to do it. That's the problem is they don't have the money there to do go. it. That's it. So it's not they like we're just to. leaving this building and going to a more modern building where our, we, we could pull our costs down. That's, you know, that's we've a little a, easier said than done. We've got, it is. We've got a number of hospitals that are still working in 1950s Hilburton Hospital. I didn't know that. That's a challenge. You know, just think about that. Think about yeah. the structure, how it was put together, the heating and cooling, the, yeah. all of the issues that come Ancient. into play there. Yeah. And it, and it costs money. And um, it's Pete Sessions, we'll have to talk about it another time, yeah. at the federal level has got a bill that would completely revamp the Obamacare exchanges that makes a lot more sense. Now, that, that is you know, a problem. Huge problem yeah. that could be fixed. You don't get the tax benefits when you're in individual coverage the way you do in, in That's employer. Right. Provi- exactly. That's a huge problem that the Fed has to fix. We That's can't right. do anything We can't do that, that one. We yeah. can't fix that one. Tim, appreciate you coming in. Thanks, yeah, man. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Thank you. You got it. Tim Moore, President CEO of the Mississippi Hospital Association. Coming right back with the final segment on Midday.